Hello, everybody. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Thank you all for joining us. I'm just letting folks uh, come into the meeting right now, just letting people kind of file in. It's going to take a few minutes. Um, we're also live on Rabble's YouTube channel. Um, so we're posting that link in our chat here. Please do share on social media um, and with your friends so we can get a bit of a, a wider audience. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We're going to start in just a few short moments. Um, there's still people filing in. Hello to everyone on the live stream, on Rabble's live stream. Hello to everyone on Zoom. We're just about to get started on our panel. We're here with Zahia El Masri, Libby Davies, Sven Robinson, Hamam Farah, and David Miviser for our event, Palestine Solidarity, Why the NDP Convention Matters. And we're gonna be starting very, very shortly. Uh, you can find out more about the host, uh, the host organization, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute at foreignpolicy.ca. So again, we're going to be starting very, very soon, just letting more folks in. Okay, so I think, I think, I think we can, I think we can get started now. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening, panelists. You can now turn on your cameras. I just want to give a big, big welcome to all of our panelists and to all of you at home for joining us, for tuning in. Um, we have what's sure to be a superb event ahead of us. I've been really, really looking forward to this. Um, and I'm just totally delighted to be hosting this critical discussion with our esteemed guests, Zahia al Mazri, Libby Davies, Sven Robinson, Hamam Farah, and Rabbi David Miviser. So my name is Bianca Bajeni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, and uh, we're the organizers of today's event. I want to offer our Deep thanks to our co-sponsoring organizations, Independent Jewish Voices, The Courage Coalition, Just Peace Advocates, Palestine House, Canadians for uh, Justice and Peace in the Middle East. Um, I also want to thank our media sponsor, uh, Rabble.ca. Uh, and uh, this is being live streamed to Rabble's uh, YouTube channel. So like I said, if you've got pals that haven't, uh, that haven't tuned into the Zoom, they can find us on Rabble. Uh, on YouTube. So please do find out more about the terrific work that all these organizations are doing. Before we begin our event tonight, I just want to acknowledge um, that I'm speaking to you from Montreal, from Jojage, which is a place, um, which is the traditional territory of the Ganyangahaka people. And it's a place that's long served as a site of meeting and exchange among many First Nations. It's, uh, it's, really, it's really incredible to see this turnout. There are, there's, hundreds, there's hundreds of, of you who've tuned in to the Zoom event and uh, we'd love to hear from you. The chat is open, um, so please say hi. I see you're saying hi, hi Douglas. Um, and let us know where, you, where you're tuning in from. Um, but as always, please keep your commentary uh, civil, cordial and free from racist, sexist or otherwise harmful commentary. Hello, Helen. Hello, everybody at home. So please post your questions in the Q&A box. We're going to have, um, we're going to basically the way that our event is going to work today is that speakers are going to give their opening remarks. And then we're going to be opening this up to questions from the audience. And we'll try to get to as many as we can, time permitting. So please do post your questions in the Q&A box specifically, not in the chat, but in the Q&A box. That's where we'll be looking. So again, my name is Bianca Bajeni, and I'm here representing the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which is an organization that challenges unjust foreign policy measures and aims to bridge the gap between the perception and reality of Canada's role in the world. And we also work to oppose the racism that's embedded in Canadian foreign policy. You can find out more about the work that we do at foreignpolicy.ca. We've been working relentlessly really to help build a hub of critical foreign policy and um, I just want to let you all know that our organization is completely reliant on contributions from our community to keep doing this work so please consider uh, becoming a member or donating at foreignpolicy.ca slash donate. So a bit of history, our organization started off um, basically launched around a campaign to oppose Canada's bid for uh, a seat on the UN Security Council. And um, one of the major focuses of this campaign was Canada's anti-Palestinian policies. Um, for me, a decade ago, um, 
during a trip to the World Education Forum, I, I personally saw firsthand the immense separation wall, the segregated roads in the West Bank. I witnessed checkpoints with their parapets and machine guns, and I talked to communities um, whose olive trees had been uprooted and homes raised by the Israeli army. Um, and it's just so clear that international solidarity matters. Canadian policies matter. And our government has sided with Israel repeatedly on almost every matter of importance. For starters, the Trudeau government has a trade agreement with Israel that treats occupied West Bank settlements as part of Israel. Just last year, the government sent a letter to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, demanding that it not investigate uh, Israel's war crimes. The Canadian government has voted against more than 50 resolutions upholding Palestinian rights. Uh, and these are resolutions that are supported by almost every nation on earth. Um, so millions of dollars in donations are subsidized um, by taxpayers in Canada for Israeli charities. And some of these support groups that are backing the Israeli military, um, West Bank settlements, and even explicitly racist organizations. So a major way that we living in Canada can contribute to the Palestinian struggle is to actually challenge our own government, um, to challenge the Trudeau government and their policies towards Palestine. And at the, at the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, we believe that it's really important to take advantage of different political moments to advance progressive foreign policy. The Security Council campaign offered one opportunity to highlight the Trudeau government's anti-Palestinian policies in a moment that had real consequences. And the NDP convention offers an opportunity to shift the yardstick, move the yardstick forward. We know the base of the NDP stands in solidarity with Palestinians. Um, we also know that the leadership is, is afraid of the anti-Palestinian lobby, but there can be no excuses. And we all need to stand up for Palestinian rights. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Hamam Farah. Hamam, Hamam is a Palestinian Canadian activist, writer, psychotherapist by profession, and a board member of the Palestinian Canadian Community Center, Palestine House. Welcome, Hamam. Thank you, Bianca. Let me start by saying that I am so excited to be here and I'm honored to speak alongside some of the leading voices on the Canadian left on such a crucial issue of our time. In the wake of the International Criminal Court's war crimes investigation on Palestinian land and the election of the most right-wing extremist pro-settler government in Israel's history, it's more than urgent it's more urgent than ever for progressives, socialists, and leftists to stand in solidarity with Palestine. Unfortunately, we've known for many years that the NDP suffers from a problem we call progressive except Palestine, or the Palestine exception, where left-wing values of equality and justice are applied to every issue of injustice except for Palestine. We saw it play out blatantly and outrageously under Thomas Mulcair, summed up in his own words, and I quote, I am an ardent supporter of Israel in all situations and in all circumstances, unquote. And now we see it play out perhaps a little less blatantly under Jagmeet Singh's centrist leadership. At the 2018 Federal Party Convention, I was there when the vote to prioritize the Palestine resolution took place. The room was packed at seven in the morning by party establishment members and those close to the leadership, just so they could vote down a modest resolution which reiterated existing NDP policy on Israel-Palestine with the addition of a settlement boycott. A lot has happened since then. In the past several months, we've seen how Palestinians in the occupied territories were excluded from Israel's vaccination program. We've seen how Charlie Angus was threatened with the repugnant IHRA definition by Israel lobby organizations for rightfully calling Israel an apartheid state. Only nine days later, the leading Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem, declared that Israel is a regime of apartheid. And just last month, the International Criminal Court finally opened its war crimes investigation. Meanwhile, Mr. Singh can't even recall that there is a Palestinian people when explicitly asked about Israel's treatment of the Palestinians by the CBC just this past Saturday. This is the context in which grassroots members of the NDP are saying enough is enough. At this year's federal convention, 
we're bringing two resolutions that would commit the party to taking a more principled stance. What I like about the two resolutions together is how they complement one another. One commits the NDP to taking meaningful action through targeted sanctions to hold Israel accountable, and the other defends our right to criticize Israel to begin with. These resolutions are the Palestine Resolution and the resolution against the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. I know my fellow speakers will talk about the latter, so I'll leave that to them and address the former. The Palestine Resolution is an updated version of the 2018 resolution. This time, it's more targeted and two-pronged. It commits the NDP to call for ending Canadian trade with illegal Israeli settlements, and it calls for an arms embargo between Canada and Israel until Palestinian rights are realized. The resolution makes it explicitly clear there is no legal or moral justification for the current status quo, whereby Canada encourages the violent and racist settlement project for Israel's military industry, or Israel's military industry. These policies are in line with international law and official Canadian policy even, which recognizes the illegality of Israeli settlements. So there should be no reason why this hasn't already happened to begin with. These policies are also the recommendations of the Canadian Labour Congress, Amnesty International, and Oxfam. Recently, the UN Human Rights Council urged all states to refrain from transferring arms to Israel because of the potential for human rights abuses. And the UN Special Rapporteur has called for a ban on settlement products. I'll now refer to a lesser known event that took place in January that we should pay close attention to. Palestinian factory workers in an illegal Israeli settlement went on strike. Among their demands were, quote, human-like conditions, unquote, holidays, pensions, and urging unions around the world to demand a boycott of Israeli settlements. After 19 days, the workers won their strike at least until the agreement goes to the Israeli courts. But still, how is it possible that a group of Palestinian workers in an illegal Israeli settlement factory working in subhuman conditions on their own stolen land were able to win concessions from the factory owner? It's because the workers were aware that they were not alone. The tremendous support that they received from trade unions and individuals around the world gave them hope and made them resilient. Mohammed Blady, the Secretary General of the Palestine New Federation of Trade Unions commented on the agreement saying, this is a victory for our striking workers. Achieving this success was anything but easy. To all of the trade unions and friends of Palestine who honestly stood in solidarity with the strikers, I say that this victory belongs to you too. By supporting the strike, you joined in the battle against oppression, racism, apartheid, and exploitation. We hope that this small victory is the beginning of other victories for our workers and our people that have been subjugated by Israel's inhumane apartheid and settler colonial oppression. If the NDP and the broader Canadian labor movement truly want to represent the interests of workers, of the oppressed, of the downtrodden, and of colonized peoples, they would do everything in their power to push for sanctions against Israel's illegal settlements and ban the arms trade with an apartheid state being investigated for war crimes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hamam. Um, thanks for your pa just passionate appeal. And um, thank you also for the useful history in describing the last convention for us and for the overview of these two Palestinian resolutions that folks uh, are talking about. Our next speaker is Libby Davies. Libby was an MP for Vancouver East from 1997 to 2015. She is the former deputy leader and former house leader of the NDP. And she's the author of Outside In, a political memoir published in 2019. Welcome Libby. Hi, thank you so much, Bianca, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, I'm speaking you, to you today from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations here in, in BC. I'm very, very happy to be uh, joined with these wonderful panelists, all of whom I know. 
um, and thank you so much to the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute for hosting this very important discussion today, as well as the sponsoring groups and also to rebel.ca, which is an organization very near and dear to my heart. So I think we're going to have a good discussion today. Um, I should just let you know that I'm going to make some comments, but Bianca also asked me if I could provide a little bit of information about the process um, at the convention, uh, as I'm sure there are people on the call who maybe would want to know that. So I will, I will do that at the end of my re remarks, Bianca. Um, I really am happy to follow up from uh, Haman because I think you have laid out so clearly why we need to be passionately involved with this issue of Palestinian solidarity and human rights and upholding international law as Canadians. Um, I want to focus my remarks today on what this means to the NDP, because I think that was what we were asked to speak about. And, and I think it's really important that we have that political discussion about the role of political parties and what we can do as grassroots members, as members, political activists of, of parties. Um, I want to begin by saying that, you know, you'll hear from some people that those of us who have been working on these two resolutions, and I very much support um, both resolutions, the one that Haman spoke about and also uh, about the settlements and um, uh, 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 the, uh, illegal goods, and also the no IHRA resolution. You'll hear from some people that those of us working on these resolutions are being used politically somehow as a wedge, we're being used as a wedge to divide the NDP and create controversy. I mean, let's just put it out there. That's what we're being partly charged with. And, and those folks are saying that these resolutions are somehow a distraction and that they even undermine not only the convention, but the, the critical work we need to do in Canada as the NDP on things like stopping income inequality, or fighting for an expand, uh, expanded public health care system and uh, getting ready for a federal election, you know, whenever that might be, sooner or later. And I want to say, I put that out there because that's an argument that we're all hearing over and over. You guys are just a wedge. You're just, you know, this is a distraction that we don't need. And I want to say, I disagree. I disagree very firmly. Those who say that we should not be debating these issues are, in fact, the very same people who are trying to create a wedge deliberately. And I would say that if people are, were responding to this question that we're debating today of these resolutions from the basis of the values, the fundamental values and the history of our party in the NDP and the respect and solidarity for human rights everywhere, then we should not, no one, no one should be trying to shut down this needed and legitimate debate. You know, this is important. It's not a distraction. It's not about undermining. It's about actually honoring the values and the history that we have in our party. I would add this as well, that the principles of fighting anti-Semitism and fighting for pro-Palestinian human rights are one. They are not oppositional. They are often put to us as oppositional, that somehow you've got to choose. These are values, these two questions are related, they are not oppositional, and they are values at the NDP that we must stand up for. I think maybe some folks know that almost 50 riding associations across the country are supporting the no IHRA resolution, as well as the Young New Democrats and many prominent Canadian Jewish Palestinian voices and allies. And Haman has also outlined the other resolution that also has very, very strong support across the country. So both of these resolutions are, are very important. I do believe more and more people and groups are recognizing that now that the IHRA working definition is very unsound, it is profoundly wrong, and it is being used as an ideological weapon against the left by conservative pro-Israel elements. 
And let's be clear that it appears to be only the left and progressive groups that are being targeted by this, by this campaign of misinformation, intimidation, and baseless accusations of anti-Semitism. I find that very interesting that it's become an ideological weapon that's being used against the left. So what is it that's really important right now? Well, we're days away from going into the NDP convention. And I think this is really the time for NDP members, the grassroots of the party who gather faithfully, loyally, with good faith to affirm their right to debate and formulate rational policy decisions and positions. We cannot allow ourselves to be bullied into silence. We should be proud to continue the work against anti-Semitism, all forms of hatred, Islamophobia, racism, and work for the rights of Palestinians. As a party, the NDP should be bold and clear on this question. We should not shy away from it. This is who we are and who we need to be. The grassroots members of the NDP have an opportunity to demonstrate this in the, in the coming days at the convention. So I, I feel like I want to appeal directly to delegates who are out there to say, this is your time to make sure that we affirm those rights to speak out and to uphold the values of our party. Now, in terms of the convention, I'll just be very quick. The closing date for registration, Bianca, was today. It is today, I presume at the end of the day, April the 5th. And there begins what is called a priorization process that begins on April the 7th, so on Wednesday, and it goes from 12.01 a.m. to 11.59 p.m., I presume, on everybody's local time zone. And what we have been given the opportunity to go online, and you'll be given uh, an easy code link, to list or to rank in each of the sections, the seven sections that are resolutions are up for debate to rank your top 10 resolutions. So this is quite a process because there's hundreds and hundreds of resolutions in the resolution book. And you can see those actually online at ndp.ca. If you go to convention 2021, you can see the seven sections. Um, the resolutions that we're speaking about are in section four um, which is Canada's place in the world. And the, um, the resolution around the trade and settlements, illegal settlements is resolution 041020. And the resolution around the no IRHA is 041120. And so we're really asking people to make sure that they use that process of the priorizations to make sure that these resolutions are high on the priority list to make sure that they do indeed get debated. Because I think many of us feel that if, if we can have that debate, the members of the NDP will, will vote in the affirmative for these resolutions. Um, there's also a process for emergency resolutions uh, that closes uh, 4 p.m. on April the 9th, which, which I guess is Friday. And emergency resolutions will be debated on the last day. But needless to say, if you go on the NDP website, there is a whole section where you can go through, you know, questions. You can even send an email to ask questions. Uh, because I know, you know, it being a virtual convention, it's going to be very different from conventions we've had in the past. And of course, we want to make sure that there is um, a good debate, that there's open debate, there's respectful debate. And we want to make sure that these two resolutions are are on the priority high and that they will get debated and they will be supported. Thank you very much, Bianca. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. Um, thank you for helping us also to understand your experiences and the need to be bold on the question of Palestinian human rights. And also thank you for clarifying um, what, what lies ahead at the convention over the next few days and how people can participate if they want to I'm looking really forward to hearing more from you in the, the Q&A. Our next speaker is Sven Robinson. Uh, Sven was the NDP MP for writings in the Vancouver suburb of Burnaby, British Columbia. Uh, Sven uh, was the longest serving uh, British Columbia MP of his time and served in parliament from 1979 to 2004. Sven is the J.S. Woodsworth resident scholar 
at Simon Fraser University. Welcome, Sven. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca. And uh, first, I, I want to join in the, the um, acknowledgement of the importance of recognizing that we come from uh, the uh, unceded uh, territories of Indigenous peoples, um, including the Musqueam, the tsleil and the Squamish uh, First Nations. Um, it's an incredible honor for me to join with this panel. Uh, and I look at the other panelists and uh, uh, what an amazing group of people who've been on the front lines of this struggle for many, many years. And so thank you. Uh, thank you, Bianca, to uh, CFPI and to all of the sponsors, uh, to my friends at Rabble, uh, for this, uh, this opportunity. It, it, it is a, a precious opportunity on the eve of a historic convention. Um, I want to make it very clear that, uh, as Libby has said, I strongly support both of these key Palestine resolutions. And thank you, Hamam, for your eloquent uh, statement uh, explaining the importance of, of both of these resolutions. And I, I very much hope that the convention will adopt both of these resolutions. Um, I, wanna, I wanna say basically about, I wanna talk about two or three key issues in the limited time I have. The first is that for me, the most important issue, the most pressing issue now is for the NDP to finally for the first time, take a strong and clear and principled stand in support and in solidarity with the Palestinian people. I have witnessed firsthand the horrors of this occupation, the brutal, dehumanizing, violent, and illegal occupation. I was there during the Intifada in the 80s, and I'll never forget the woman who was pleading with the Israeli soldiers to, to let her young son go as one of the soldiers took his baton and smashed it on the arm of that young boy and broke his arm. I will never forget being at the checkpoints. At the checkpoints in 2001, after the, after the siege at Jenin, and seeing the humiliation and the degradation that daily confronts the Palestinian people. Some of you remember I challenged the IDF at that time about the illegality. Uh, of the occupation, and I, I commend to everyone uh, the, the recent film, The Present, that so powerfully and movingly documents uh, the impact on the daily lives of the Palestinian people as well. So, so that's what this is all about. This is about ending an occupation that is illegal, that is violent, that is in breach of United Nations resolutions and international law. And everything we do has to be focused on that and on solidarity with the Palestinian people. And yes, of course, on fighting anti-Semitism, on fighting all forms of hatred, as our resolution says. I also want to take a word about to say why it's particularly important that the NDP at this convention take a stand. And that is because, quite frankly, the history of the NDP is a history too often of silence, silence and failure to stand up for the people of Palestine. And I've seen it under too many leaders. I myself was fired as a justice critic, for the, as, the, uh, as the foreign affairs uh, Middle East critic, uh, when I spoke out after returning from Janine, Libby faced the humiliation of, of, of being attacked, unfortunately, and, and, and the, the tragedy of, of, of the N then NDP leader phoning the Israeli ambassador to apologize. Uh, we've seen NDP candidates under the leadership of Tom Mulcair being blocked from running, including shamefully Paul Manley uh, being blocked from running. And of course, under the present leadership, sadly, this trend has continued. I was grilled myself when I was vetted as a candidate. And Bob Ray's words were put to me about whether I, in fact, was prepared to stand up uh, firmly and continue to stand against state terrorism uh, of the Israelis and war crimes. Um, in the most recent vetting process, just in the last couple of months, and I, I'm very sorry to say this, but. NDP candidates, I know of one, at least one who has been grilled about uh, that candidate's uh, 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 opposition to the IHRA definition. This should not be happening. And Hamam has already made reference to the absolutely appalling silence of our leader during the interview uh, on the House. So we have an opportunity, my friends, as NDP delegates to say to our leadership and to our caucus that this, is, this has got to stop that this silence must end, that we must stand in solidarity. And yes, New Democrat MPs have made a difference. I'm delighted that Peter Julian, that Alexander Boris, that Nikki Ashton have spoken out in support 
of our IHRA resolution. I know as well that Matthew Green has spoken in support of the, uh, the other Palestine resolution. Uh, and we hope, of course, that he will do the same on the IHRA. Uh, uh, we know that uh, Jack Harris has taken a principal stand on the ICC, uh, on annexation. Charlie Angus, as Imam mentioned, has spoken out on vaccination. But we have to, as a party, take a stand. And that's what these resolutions give us an opportunity to do. It's wonderful that over 50, that almost 50 writings have supported this, that Labour has supported this, that the Younger Democrats have taken a strong stand in support of this. But as Libby said, it's fundamentally about freedom of speech and it's about our party having the right to debate this. A letter went out recently from, from some members of the NDP from the Jewish community saying that we should prevent this debate from taking place. Well, what happened to grassroots democracy? So I say, let's have the debate. I hope both resolutions will pass. Let's fight anti-Semitism in real terms, along with all other forms of hatred. The Jerusalem Declaration, for example, gives us a real opportunity to fight anti-Semitism. Uh, we also have an opportunity here, it seems to me, to take a stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people for the first time in the history of our party. This is not about an equal negotiation between two equal parties. It is about an oppressor and an oppressed. Just as that was the case in South Africa when we fought apartheid, so too must we stand in solidarity with the oppressed. And the NDP convention has a chance now to take that stand by supporting both of these resolutions, to stand up for freedom of speech as academics across the country have demanded, including Jewish academics. And I deeply, deeply appeal to NDP delegates to take this stand, to prioritize these resolutions, and to ensure that we stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people and for freedom of speech. Thank you, Sven. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for just reminding us of the importance of grassroots democracy and also enlightening us to the difficulties that have been faced. Um, just the, the marginalization and the silencing faced by those uh, in the party who have, who have stood up in defense of uh, Palestinian people. Um, and just for highlighting the need for the NDP to make a principal stand in defense of Palestinian self-determination. I would like uh, to just remind people that we're gonna have a Q&A later. So please be putting your questions in the Q&A chat. Delighted to announce that there are over 330 people watching on Zoom. It's a great turnout. Um, thank you all for being here. Our next speaker is Zaya El Mazri. Zaya is of Palestinian descent and was born in Borj El Barajne, refugee camp in Lebanon. She arrived in Cartierville with her parents when she was 11 years old. She's an activist and former NDP candidate for Ahunsik Cartierville. Welcome, Zaya. Thank you so much, Bianca, for having me. I am extremely honored to be on this panel with these most amazing people. Uh, I mean, I've seen firsthand your work uh, in solidarity with the Palestinian human rights, and it just goes to show that this is something that we need to stand in solidarity together. I'd like to first begin by acknowledging that my presence in Tia Tuyaki, Montreal, takes place on the unceded indigenous lands of the Kanyan Keha Mohawk Nation. Kanyan Kehaka is known as a gathering place for many First Nations, and we recognize the Kanyan Kehaka as custodians of the land and waters on which we gather today. Thank you for the Canadian Foreign Institute uh, for organizing this event of which we are an immense need to and for all the other supporters as well. At a time when we are combating racism and hatred in all their forms, at a time when we say we stand with standing crop, we stand with the what's a, what's a nation, when we all say aloud and in the streets, I can't breathe. At a time when our hearts bleed for Joyce Eshaquan, for her suffering and for her family and what they've been through. At a time when migrant workers that I have, have helped to keep us fed here in Canada during the pandemic are dying from lack of access to healthcare. At a time like this, we should gather our forces to fight every kind of racism and hatred. As NDPers and as a member of the NDP, we should be the ones to enable the change that we speak about in our campaigns and not just speak as mere slogans. We should embody it in our actions. And today is the perfect opportunity to do so. My first convention at the NDP was in, uh, I forgot the year, but was in Halifax. And I got this book 
Why Sometimes David Win. And I recommend to everybody to read it. Because when he spoke to me, Marshall Gans, and I told him that I was Palestinian, he said, this is our struggle. And he was talking about unions and the strikes and union strikes. He said, this is our struggle. Because when we say that we are fighting for social justice, it's not about excluding a cause. It's about being inclusive. It's not a buffet. You can't go choose and say, I'm going to defend this person's human rights and ignore the other person's human rights. If we as NDPers truly stand for social justice and human rights values, it means we are inclusive and we defend all of these. Today, it's a time for us as Palestinian Canadians where we find ourselves being silenced in fear and terrorized because our basic human rights and freedoms are under threat. But this time, it's not only us. This time, this is an attack on human rights groups and activists and the solidarity movement at large. Telling our story, the story of our ancestors, my story with the key that you see right behind me. This is the key that my parents left with from Haifa, Palestine. If we, if the IHRA definition, the new one is adopted, I won't be able to tell the story of my ancestors. I won't be able to tell the story of the Nakba, the catastrophe that happened to the Palestinian people. I won't be able to tell the story of the, dis the dispossession of over 800,000 Palestinians from their villages. I won't be able to tell the story of their Yassin massacre. And these are all facts that happened on the ground. Even if, the, if it happens and we have the IHRA resolution, it won't change the reality on the ground that these happened and we will continue to speak up about these atrocities. Palestinians have been living under this kind of terror and oppression. I can just give you a couple of examples of the things we won't be able to say anymore because of the fear. I'm a board member of the Canadian Palestinian Foundation here in Quebec. And we see that students live in fear. Families are telling their children, don't participate in any more political, political events because they are being terrorized and in fear of being labeled anti-Semitic. We stand against all form of hatred, including hatred towards Palestinians, including anti-Semitism, including anti-Asian, including anti We stand against all forms of hatred, but has to be inclusive of Palestinian human rights as well. One of the examples that I wanted to share with you that we won't be able to do anymore is basically when we have our regular events and we show, we share the history of Palestine, we share the evolution of the map, we talk about the wall, we talk of the, of the villages, we talk of the different artists that want to showcase their history of Palestine. We won't be able to do that anymore. But these ongoing tactics intimidate act activists for Palestinian human rights. They chill criticism of Israeli government practices and they impair a fair-minded dialogue on the pressing question of Palestine rights. Like Libby mentioned, what we should be doing is encouraging people to have this dialogue. What this definition does is on the contrary, it suppresses dialogue and it's not taking us forward. This is what we should be focusing on. We don't want censorship, just as we can criticize the Canadian government, just as we can criticize the Saudi Arabian government, just as we can criticize any other government's policies, we should be able to criticize the Israeli government's policy. This is what's at the heart of the issue. We are all in this fight together against all forms of hatred, discrimination, and racism, including Palestinian human rights. And this is what we should focus on. We should be telling the story of what's happening on the ground to Palestinians. These are the facts. Forcible transfer of Palestinians to make way for illegal Israeli settlements preventing Palestinians from returning to their homes on lands, systematic and severe deprivation of fundamental human rights of Palestinians based on their identity. And this didn't happen overnight. We've had numerous laws passed for people who support activists who support the boycott campaign. It's been an ongoing issue. And we know what happened with the organization rights and democracy here in Canada. This is not in the US, under Harper. We know how they were silenced. So these silencing techniques have just been escalating. And it's up to us as NDPers, as activists to take a stand today. This is our chance. Every voice matters. We've all said it and we will repeat it. Every voice matters. I just wanna encourage everybody to take a stand, 
for human rights and for Palestinian human rights and for a dialogue for us to be able to speak in order to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zahia. Thank you for your passionate appeal and your reminder um, for us to, to use our voices and to fight all forms of hatred and racism, including defending the fundamental rights of Palestinians. The final speaker of the evening is Rabbi David Miviser. Rabbi David Miviser uh, retired after serving um, synagogues in Vancouver for 20 years and has lived in Israel for four years at different times in his life. He's been involved deeply and personally with Israel and Palestine for 50 years. Two of his adult children are, are Israeli citizens and have lived in Israel for years. David is an advocate for justice, freedom, and equality for Palestinians and an active member of independent Jewish voices in Canada and of Jewish Voice for Peace in the US, as well as an active member of the NDP and will be a delegate to the NDP convention from Hamilton Center. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. I really appreciate being able to be here with you. And I really appreciate absolutely the passion and the depth with which everyone else has spoken, especially Zahia to follow you right now is pretty amazing. And I'm also quite conscious that in my introduction, we just said, I lived in Jerusalem for three years. I lived in Tiberias, Tabaria for a year. Uh, my, my older daughter is in Yaffa right now. My son lived there for years, and I imagine you've never been there, and you've never lived there. You can't go there, and yet you're from there, and actually, I'm not, and I could, right now, I could go to the airport, get on a plane, fly there, and stay there the rest of my life, be welcomed with open arms. I could be given government subsidies to buy a house possibly, well, not in Haifa, but in the West Bank, literally be given government subsidies and be encouraged to do that. And part of the financial picture actually is uh, charitable donations from people here in Canada going to support settlers living there on the land. You know, I imagine maybe not your family, but perhaps your cousins or others were driven right off of. So just to be speak, here with you and, and after you, it's, it's an honor and uh, I feel you know, very grateful that I'm able to do that. I don't wanna to take too long. So many points have been made already, but let me like others acknowledge where I'm speaking from. You mentioned I'm gonna be a, a delegate from Hamilton Center. I moved here just a couple of years ago and I learned that this is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee people, something I was shocked to learn as we talk about self-determination of nations is that as recently as less than a hundred years ago, after the First World War, when the League of Nations was determining the right of self-determination, the Haudenosaunee's from right here in Ontario sent a delegation to the League of Nations to be recognized as a nation with the right of self-determination and uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada stopped it. So Canada does have quite a long history of denying the right of self-determination of many, many, many nations. And anyone who lives in British Columbia can just look around and see that that's still going on today. And also when I moved here, first time I heard about the, um, the dish with one spoon treaty, it was like, I didn't know what that is. The dish with one spoon is the idea that we all live kind of like in one big dish. There's a lot of resources here for us to eat from and there's one spoon and we all have to share it. So that's where I'm speaking from in a very physical way. That's where I'm sitting today in Hamilton, Ontario. But anyway, the, the topic is the importance of the NDP convention. And what I what I, I want to say kind of directly is that the NDP right now is the only party in Canada that would even consider the possibility of taking a um, moral stand on Palestine. 
The conservatives, as we saw under Stephen Harper, went just the opposite direction. They had policies that were actually beyond what Bibi Netanyahu did. The Liberal Party, I think, is completely sold out and basically owned lock, stock, and barrel by the Zionist lobby in Canada. And the Green Party, unfortunately, just made a choice to reject a leader who would have led it to take a moral stand on Palestine and instead chose someone who I think is extremely compromised. So any of us in Canada who want a party to bring this topic into the national discourse so that it can even get a platform and be heard, our choice is the NDP. And then what's up with the NDP? I've been watching the chat on the screen here and people are saying, well, why did Jagmeet Singh like avoid this topic? What is going on here? What's the matter, you know? So clearly the NDP has been controlled. I'll just say it straight out by the Zionist lobby in Canada, the Israel lobby in Canada. There's a rather small number of extremely influential individuals who have been able to build personal relationships with many people in the leadership of the NDP. Uh, my impression is that many of them are hidden in back rooms. I've been active in the NDP for 25 years. I don't exactly know who these people are, but it doesn't reflect the rank and file or the membership of the NDP. We have almost 350 people on this call. So why is the NDP so influenced? And again, I'll just say it's been controlled clearly by the Israel lobby, that there's a name for that thing. It's called Sija. And Sija is trying right now to even get this resolution that Sven and Libby initiated, just kicked out of the convention. That's what they're used to doing. We've already heard they did that in 2018, despite the fact that in 2018, something like two dozen um, writing associations passed it. They just, it never got discussed. So that's not gonna happen this time. We're going to vote for it. I expect it will be prioritized, but we'll see. Anyway, I'll just, I just want to move on and talk a little bit about Sija. Sija is the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. It purports to speak for Canadian Jews, and I'll acknowledge it. It's, it does speak for a certain band on the spectrum of Canadian Jews. We have a lot of different opinions among ourselves. The organization that I'm most active with called Independent Jewish Voices, together with another Jewish organization called the United Jewish People's Order, in 2018 commissioned a survey, a study by a completely professional survey organization called ECOS. And they just surveyed Jews in Canada and their survey showed that 37% of the Jews in Canada have a negative evaluation of the Israeli government. I just want to repeat that 37% of the Jews in Canada negatively relate to the Israeli government. 30% of the Jews in Canada think that the Palestinian civil society request for BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions is justified. And 34% of the Jews in Canada think that the Canadian government's attempts to stifle that is wrong. We have a prime minister who very proudly said that BDS has no place in Canada. And the IHRA is a fraudulent attempt to claim that somehow that that's anti-Semitic. I think it's anti-Semitic for anybody to claim to speak for 37% of Canadian Jews and misrepresent us. 
So I feel like I'm kind of out of time here. I don't know how much longer I could, you know, I could talk like this for hours, but I just want to repeat my few points. One, the NDP is extremely important. It's the only party in Canada where you can even talk about this stuff. The second thing is the NDP has been controlled and the NDP I think is starting to open up and become more democratic. I hope it will, we'll find that out by the end of this weekend. And the third is that the people pushing this lie, this fraudulent attempt to mislead the rest of this country that they somehow speak for the Jews of Canada cannot get away with that any longer. We're gonna call them out and we'll say the truth. And you can even go, if you want, to the website of Independent Jewish Voices, look for the report on this survey, and that'll help you make the same argument that they don't speak for us. And I'll, I'll just leave it there. I look forward to questions and discussion. And I just really thank all the organizations that brought this together and thank every single person that's here listening. It's so important. So thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you for your passionate appeal and um, for sharing your perspective and for being willing to share your blunt assessment of what is going on internally um, and just for being a, a passionate uh, defender of the rights of, uh, of Palestinian people. I can't wait to hear more from you in the chat. So we are now moving on to the next uh, part of the evening. We're in the Q&A period. We have a lot of questions um, from the audience and we're gonna try and get to as many of them as possible. Um, <clears throat> so the, the first questions, I'm just gonna take two because they're sort of quite similar from Chris Langford and Martin Tweedale. For tonight's info session, will you be walking us through why some find the IHRA definition um, a problem in terms of blocking criticism of Israel for state actions. I'm one of the delegates. From my writing, it seems to me that using the IHRA definition in all actual fact can't stop us as a party or government from criticizing Israel. And then Martin Tweedale asks, what is the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism? I'm going to put that out to, 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 to all panelists. David. Well, I'll go first. The person who asked, what is it? I, I, we don't have time to get into that, I don't think, but I really encourage you to go to a website that we created, www.noihra.ca, and just read up on it. And then I've also, I'm gonna just say something kind of funny about myself. When I uh, take off my glasses, so I look okay, then I can't read the chat. So, so I've read in the chat, some people saying like, oh, well, it's not legally binding. And, um, you know, if they pass it into law, it will be challenged constitutionally. So I wanna say that there is a huge chilling effect, as I believe Zahia said, as I know Hamam personally experienced, and I've experienced myself, whereby there's a kind of a dominant attitude that if you stand up clearly for Palestinian rights, it's made to look like somehow you're anti-Jewish and that's not okay. You can lose your job, you can be denied grants, you can be kept off of panels, you can be kind of quietly kept out of certain places. It doesn't have to be legally binding to have that kind of effect. So anyone who makes the argument, which is a defensive, apologetic, fraudulent argument that this won't be used against anybody that criticizes Israel, they either don't know what they're talking about or they're intentionally trying to mislead you. I wanna give some back. <laughs> you, may, you may, but wait, hold on, hold on. Let me, please, Sven, you're the, you're the best. I just wanna make a point. The whole entire purpose of the IHRA, the reason it was created, the reason it was fabricated was to brand anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism. It was created after the Durban conference in South Africa by people who were upset about the declaration that Zionism is racism and they wanted to stop that. 
The main one I know about is Erwin Kotler, former Minister of Justice in Canada. I think he's the main mover behind this. I think it's like a big lie technique where they came up with a plausible lie and just keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. So the, re the reason for the IHRA is to silence talk about Palestine. It's not a flaw. It's not an accident. That's why it was created. And we could get more into that. I just invite yeah. Sven. I just want to go ahead, Sven. Yes, sorry, just a, a couple of a couple of points I wanted to add. I, I mean, I think one of the most serious questions is the, the definition in and of itself, the wording of the definition, and we don't have time to get into this, but the definition in and of itself is relatively benign. What the danger though is in what they call the examples. And there are 11 examples. Seven of those examples deal directly with, with Israel and criticism of the policies of the government of Israel. Is this uh, hypothetical? It's real. In fact, one of the key authors of the IHRA definition, Kenneth Stern, Jewish, uh, respected Jewish academic, one of the authors, has warned against the weaponization of this definition. The, the, the definition has already been used to attack New Democrat members of parliament. When Charlie Angus and another NDP member of parliament, for example, spoke out about the denial of vaccines for Palestinians in the occupied territories, conservative MPP in Ontario said, this is a breach of the IHRA definition. The Israeli, one of the top Israeli uh, uh, diplomats in Ottawa attacked Charlie saying that this is a breach of the IHRA definition. Uh, over 150 Jewish academics have said that this is a serious threat to academic freedom and freedom of speech as well. So it is already silencing people. I want to say one other thing as well, and, and David spoke very eloquently about the way that, that anti-Semitism is used to shut down debate. It's also being used as a weapon against the left more generally. And let's recognize and call that out for what it is. Right. The fact that Jeremy Corbyn, for example, has been attacked as anti-Semitic, and in fact, he's fought racism and hatred all his life. It's not because of that, it's because he's a left-winger, he's a socialist. Exactly and it right. was shameful yeah. that when Nikki Ashton actually uh, hosted an event with Jeremy Corbyn, that, that my party raised questions about that, an event for Progressive International. So let's be clear, this is not anti-Semitism. We fight anti-Semitism, we fight hatred, but what it is about is weaponizing and silencing those who would speak in solidarity with the Palestinian people. It has been used and it will be used again. And the last point I want to make is that there's legislation coming up in the House on online hatred and CJA. David referred to CJA. CJA is already pushing all parliamentarians to include the IHRA definition in this uh, framework of legislation. The NDP, what stand will we take? The NDP justice critic is Randall Garrison. He says he supports the IHRA definition. Well, my friends, I hope that the membership of our party at our convention will send a very clear message that this is not acceptable, that we do not accept this definition being used to weaponize and silence voices of solidarity. Bianca, if I may add one more thing. Regarding yes, please go ahead, Zaya. Extremely important, but I want to mention the example seven because, like David and Sven said, it's not the definition itself. In fact, many Jewish-based groups they say that the definition itself it's it's very weird, like it's not clear at all. You know, there are much better definitions that are out there that can be used. However, example seven because there was a question: How is it that I won't be able to talk about Nakba anymore? Our own catastrophe. Example seven in the definition says denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination by claiming that the existence of, state, of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor. And there's another, another example where it says, there's a, uh, there's a way where you can't criticize the policies of the state of Israel because then you'll be criticizing the Jewish people as a whole. Now, these two examples are extremely problematic because if I am going to talk about our own dispossession, our own Nakba, the overall aura, the overall intent of this resolution is to silence me because people will be afraid to listen to even what I have to say in the fear of being labeled anti-Semitic because it is a real horrific charge to be labeled anti-Semitic, rightfully so, and we should be combating that. However, this definition, the intent that it is 
coming out with is to conflate the criticism of the state of Israel and its policies with being anti-Semitic. So by me mentioning Nakba, mentioning the racist laws that Israel is implementing on Palestinians, by me mentioning the genocide and what Israel did to Palestinians, I will be labeled anti-Semitic and I won't be able to speak it if we follow this definition. And therefore, this is why we say it will impede any dialogue and we need this dialogue more than ever today. Um, Bianca, if I could just add a very quick word. I, go I think, ahead. Thank you. I think the problem that we're really facing is that the um, IHRA definition has now become a general narrative right? I mean, even people in the chat are saying, well, what does the definition say? What are these 11 examples? Well, most people are not going to, um, you know, have the time uh, to go and look it all up and sort of examine what they think uh, is relevant or not. The problem is, is it's now become um, very politically mainstream. It's being used in the political world by politicians um, who want to shut down debate. And I think that's, that's to me, it's sort of like a, a new kind of McCarthyism, right? Where you brand people. Um, and, and we saw that, you know, in the 1950s. Um, and that's what's taking place here. And it's very, very dangerous. And I, I really want to be part of a party that is willing to stand up against that um, and to be true to the history and the roots that we have. And to say that this narrative is false it is being used against the left. I think that's very clear. It's not being used against the real anti-Semitics. It's not being used against the right wing. It's being used against us because we dare to speak out on Palestinian solidarity. So it's the narrative itself, right? It becomes, you know, just this one little line, you know, and well, you're an anti-Semitic because this IHRA definition says that you are. And so I think that's what we have to change. And as others have pointed out, there are some really excellent examples from independent Jewish voices, the Jewish declaration that just came out. that are much more nuanced and thoughtful of their approach about what this debate is all about. And so I would certainly encourage people to go look at those um, other um, uh, discussions and, and declarations because I think they give a much truer picture um, about what anti-Semitism is and what we need to do to protect freedom of speech. And just a quick word too, the Independent Jewish Voices website has a very, very powerful and comprehensive background on the uh, IHRA uh, uh, definition that I would encourage everybody to look at. Et si je peux dire deux mots en français aussi sur le site web de, de, de Voix Indépendant Juive, il y a une déclaration très importante de ce qui se passe dans cette définition. Alors je vous encourage d'aller là aussi. Thank you, Sven. Unless there's anyone else that wants to chime in, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is from Alawi Mohideen, who asks, why is it that people, including many in the left and the NDP make an exception for Palestine? There must be something at the root of this. What is it? Um, uh, yeah. Chime in. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this is not something new to us. Uh, I've been here for over 35 years. The first time that I told them I was from Palestine, people didn't know where that is. And it was a question. Um, but the, this hate or this uh, willingness to turn a blind eye of what's happening in Palestine isn't new. We've been going through with it. We saw what happened in Gaza recently with the illegal blockade that is still ongoing, okay? There's something that comes where people are afraid to speak up because it goes back to the root of being afraid to be labeled. And this is something that we have been going through as a Palestinian community here for a long time. And like I mentioned, do you know that there's a website called the Canary website where you have names of Palestinian activists, of human rights activists who support the Palestinian cause that are denounced and smeared and shamed. And this is happening now in an age where we say no to intimidation, this is happening to human rights activists. So if we go back, because there's a lack of awareness, this is what we need to be doing. We need to be raising awareness so that people can see the other point of view, because so far we have only one point of view. When we listen to the media, when we listen to the narrative, we have only one point of view. 
and, and the international solidarity movement has done a lot of work to raise awareness about the Palestinian cause, as is proven by the visit of Libby Davis of Sven also to the occupied Palestinian territories. Alexandre Boulris a déjà visité la Palestine. En tant que journaliste, il a même été pour visiter Gaza aussi. Fait que ça, c'est quelque chose pour nous qu'il faut soulever, soulever cette attention pour discuter avec la population ici de ce qui se passe sur le fait, sur le terrain en Palestine, parce que c'est hyper important. Sinon, nous allons continuer d'avoir un seul point de vue qui ne représente pas ni la réalité et qui, dit, qui démontre l'injustice que, 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 ce, que cette cause vit avec quotidiennement et que le peuple palestinien vit avec quotidiennement. Uh, Bianca, I think um, it's a very good question that's being raised and I'd like to kind of raise it into um, a bigger perspective and that is, um, you know, we're talking about the NDP and the upcoming convention and what, what may or may not happen in our party uh, on this vote and debate. Um, but I think we should also look at the bigger perspective here. And that is what one of the things that I've been very concerned about is that we, we you know, why is there an exception around Palestine? Well, I think partly, I mean, David has outlined very well the very powerful forces that are at work in trying to um, narrow the debate and, and brand people to shut down debate. But I think it's also uh, in the political world, we're, we're living in a time where political discourse um, on some, on particularly international affairs issues is getting smaller and smaller. And I think this is something that should, it, you know, it affects all political parties. It's not just the NDP. Um, so I don't want to just single out our party. I think it's something that's been taking place in Ottawa. Um, it, it certainly began more so under Stephen Harper, but even before that, I mean, I, when I was first on Parliament Hill, I remember we used to have amazing events, Palestinian events. We would have speakers like Robert Fisk and many others who would come and speak to parliamentarians and we would have members from all parties. And I mean, all parties show up. Um, but then this, this um, uh, you know, this, this, uh, sort of environment took over, the, the, the big chill. And so I, I do think that in talking about this issue, we have to protect the space for, for discourse politically, right? For all political parties, for all political players and not allow it to be shut down. And that's why this debate at the NDP is gonna be so important because it's an opportunity for new Democrats to take a stand to say, we're not going to be a part of that. You know, I can think back to many historical issues in Canada, whether it was the internment of Japanese Canadians, whether it was the War Measures Act, where, you know, the discourse of the day was just to go along with these things. But it was the NDP that stood up and said, no, we, we you know, we, we look at this from a, a, a broad perspective of people's rights and what's right and what's wrong. And that's what we have to do today. So we need to be active in the party. I don't want people to leave. I don't want people to say, well, that's it, we throw up our hands in horror. If we don't stay and fight on this issue, if we don't claim the space and open up the space for proper and respectful debate that's based on international law, that's based on human rights, on a whole number of foreign policy questions, then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be part of the problem. We, ha we have to be part of moving this forward, this debate. And I think that, I hope that's what we'll see on the weekend at the convention. I think we've also got, a, if just briefly, if I can say, we've also got an, a kind of an exciting opportunity in terms of the leadership of the party itself. We've mentioned the resolutions, but something else that happens at the convention is we elect a new executive. Uh, and uh, the uh, one of the candidates for the uh, presidency of the NDP, Jessa McLean, has been a really outspoken advocate uh, on both of our resolutions. She's spoken out clearly and eloquently on both of these resolutions. She's spoken out strongly about the importance of grassroots democracy as well. And so I just wanted to give a shout out as well for, for those of us, uh, for those who are watching and particularly for delegates to, to, to make sure that we have that kind of strong progressive leadership within the party as well. I think that's a real opportunity. Thank you, Sven. Would anyone else like to chime in on this question? David. I think the question was why is Palestine in some ways exceptional? And I'd just like to add some things that just haven't been said out loud. Um, so quite honestly, I think there's a, there was, and maybe still is, a lot of sympathy toward Jews 
because of the Holocaust. And the historical reality is about one third of all the Jewish people in the world were intentionally murdered um, 75 and 80 years ago. And I think after that, there's a lot of sympathy for Jews and that leads people to wanna to make space in the world for Jews, which is, that's an okay and good thing. I, I think that should be named. Another um, factor that hasn't been mentioned here is there are a lot of um, Christians who have a religious belief about what they call the Holy Land and what will happen in some kind of um, end times and the role that Jews play in that. And they have a kind of um, religious belief that really sidelines Palestinians. I, I could say a little more directly, maybe more honestly, I think they, they see what's going on there through the lens of their own interpretation of what they think they're reading in the Bible as if that land is just the land of the Bible. And the people living there today are somehow playing out roles that they think they're reading in the Bible and kind of projecting onto the current reality. Um, and I actually, I think that describes a lot of people in the previous Canadian um, conservative government and people that still have a lot of power in the United States and even here. Um, so I'm just, and then another factor I'd like to say, just in answering this question, is I think there is a, a kind of a whole global colonialist imperialist force that has been depriving the people living in those countries that we call the Middle East of control of their own countries and their own resources. And frankly, they're using the rest of us to, to to maintain control over it. If you go and you look at what happened after the First World War, how um, France and the UK divided up what we call the Middle East. And then what happened after the Second World War when the, like, the US and the UK were competing basically to take over the oil in what we call Saudi Arabia, although the Sa who are the Saudis, you know? And in Iran, you know, I'm just saying it's a lot bigger. It's a lot, lot bigger than what we've said. There's many yeah. big factors. And the question may have just been a rhetorical question to make the point that Palestinians do often get ignored. And in some ways, I feel like even in our conversation right now, we've spent almost all of our time talking about anti-Semitism, and we've hardly talked at all about actually what's going on with Palestinians. What do Palestinians need in Palestine how can Canada play a positive role in bringing that about? You know, what's, what can Canada do to actually help Palestinians achieve you know, equality, democracy, freedom, justice, any control over their own land, their own resources, exactly what we all want for ourselves? Why should Palestinians have any less than that? You know? So well, anyway. I think that brings me actually right. to our next question. Oh, Zahia, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, it's this polarization of the debate and all other debates in our society today. And that's what we see happening with the Palestinians. And like so, you so rightfully pointed out, David, we always seem to be uh, as almost an afterthought. However, the international solidarity movement, the solidarity movement here in Canada, yes, there's a lot of sympathy for the Palestinian cause, but what we need to do is to move beyond sympathy and as and peers to put it into action at our convention in our policies in our foreign policy when we speak out in the media you know so yes there is this polarization and again as ndp peers it's very important to us because we talk about decolonizing our mind well we need to do it and applying it to all the causes you know and stop making palestine as the exception you know, decolonize, it's across, you know, the line. And just as well, I think uh, I want to come back to Hamam's opening statement because, and David touched on this, because while it's incredibly important that we that we do everything we can to to support the re the, the resolution AIHRA, it's also important to support the resolution that calls for concrete steps to be taken by Canada: economic pressure, banning settlement products, 
ban on military sales um, as, as a, just a basic step in solidarity with the, the Palestinian people. I think we have to, I think it's really important that we, that we do both and we acknowledge the importance of, of both of these important steps uh, uh, as, we, um, as we move forward. I have to say as well that um, during the debate on the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement, which took place not that long ago in, in Parliament, I was pleased the NDP did take a strong position with respect to the issue of, of settlement products not even being labeled. And in fact, the NDP opposed the, uh, the SIFTA, the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement, and made some strong speeches on that. So, you know, whether it's on that issue, whether it's Jack speaking out on the International Criminal Court, uh, uh, on annexation and so on, we have to encourage new Democrats who are taking strong and principled positions in concrete measures by supporting both of these key resolutions at the convention. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. So we're gonna move on to the next question, which is from David Comer, Comer Ford, who asks, how do we get Canadians to better understand that this issue is not about two equal sides who need to negotiate peace, but an issue of fundamental human rights of one people who've been dispossessed of their land and occupied by another people who refuse to adhere to international law and to the right, Palest and to the right of Palestinians to equal rights on their own land um, and not about taking a neutral position necessarily, but about taking a position based on principles and values. Um, if I may just say, there's no such thing as a neutral position in this case, because we either stand with justice or we turn a blind eye and we become complicit with the injustice that is being committed on the ground. So, a way for us to stand with Palestinians and with human rights, again, is to raise awareness, is to speak about what's happening on the ground. Is to have, for example, we had a delegation of politicians, Canadian politicians, who visited Palestine and Israel two years ago. When they came back, there was such a, a response in a way to say, wait, don't, you know, let's reduce the press conferences. Let's not talk a lot about what happened over there. Let, you know, let's just let it go by. Yes, you visit it, but let's not have the aftermath that we expect from when a parliamentarian goes and visits. So again, it's all related to this atmosphere of fear. And again, it's not new. This has been escalating over the years until we reached this, for example, now we're talking about the IAIHRA definition. We shouldn't even be having this discussion. Our discussion should be focused, like you mentioned before. Uh, David, you mentioned it. What's happening on the ground? What are the facts that are happening on the ground? How can we help resolve this issue and inform people that, yes, this is about an oppressor and an oppressed people? It's like almost as Palestinian activists, we've been pushed backwards and backwards and backwards in our narrative. And at the beginning, we weren't being listened to. When we started being listened to, we were allowed to say this much. Now we're almost allowed to say nothing about our Nakba, about what we've been through, about what's happening on the ground today, keeping in mind that everything that we talk about is supported by international law, by International Court of Justice, by the United Nations, by human rights organizations, all of this, all of these are facts, but unfortunately, there's an atmosphere, a climate of fear that we cannot speak out, and that's what we have to fight against. You know, yeah, can, can we hear from Hamam maybe on this as well? I think there's another important Palestinian voice that I, I, I think, uh, particularly on this subject, it would be great to, to hear from Hamam. Well, yeah, I, I was just thinking, and I was going to say that I think one of the things that's being left out of our uh, of, of these discussions uh, more so is is the class component really. And I think that the decline of the labor movement over the years, over you know, years of neoliberal onslaught plays a big role in the picture that we need to kind of uh, you know, re reincorporate into our analysis of what's happening. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the working classes, the labor movement, labor unions, uh, they historically have uh, done, uh, you know, because of the power, the labor power that they have, they've historically stood on the side of the oppressed and especially we, we saw with South Africa, um, the, you know, there were various strikes and various uh, boycott initiatives, including, you know, uh, the famous uh, uh, dock workers uh, uh, actions where uh, uh, Canadian workers refused to offload uh, South African ships 
uh, of their goods uh, uh, in solidarity with uh, with uh, with South Af with Black South Africans, um, and that uh, of course helped to uh, raise awareness and and put apply pressure on the apartheid government in South Africa. Now this is the kind of direct action that we need to see taking place here. So I don't think it's only just a matter of raising awareness, but it's also looking at the material interests and where they lie in this whole thing. Um, really, we really need to get workers on side here. We really need to get workers mobilized. We need to get the Canadian working classes organized uh, so that they can stand with Palestinians. And I would also include, I do want to also take a look at ourselves here as Palestinian, as the Palestinian community in Canada, we need to also talk about bringing out more Palestinians in the community and particularly the majority of which are working class people in Canada um, who don't have a voice, uh, uh, who have many grievances, many issues that we're not, uh, you know, uh, uh, going around uh, trying to understand uh, what, uh, what poor uh, uh, working class Palestinian families are going through in this country. And if we can get and get, you know, speak, speak for them and, uh, 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 stand in solidarity with their issues um, and get them organized, uh, then I think we can, uh, uh, we can have a more positive uh, impact, uh, more material impact on this issue and, 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 and start really getting um, uh, a, a more, uh, what do you call it, like, a, like boycott actions actually start to happen. So it's not just in, in, in the rhetoric, not just in talking about it, but also in taking concrete action um, uh, and, and the workers have the power to do that. We just need to kind of steer the discussion back into that, uh, 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 that, that, that flavor, so to speak. I think that, um, you know, I don't know about other people, but I try to find balance in my life, <laughs> you know, between work and doing other things and health. And so normally I always think of balance as a good word, um, but in this context, balance the, you know, it comes up so often that you have to be balanced. And it's, I think we need to understand it as a, a, a pure political framing of the debate. Again, a, a, a false political framing to narrow the debate. This is not about a question of balance. It is not a question about a conflict where there are two equal sides. This is a question of an occupier and the occupied, it's a, his, it's a, it's a question of, of grave injustice where there, there has been no balance. So, you know, I, I experienced that question very often in political life in Ottawa where I was told you have to be balanced, right? As though there was this sense of equality on both sides. And, and I think we have to call it out for what it is, that it, it's just a political framing, again, to try and narrow the debate and to stop you know, the truth about what needs to be spoken about from coming out. So I'm glad, I'm glad um, somebody raised that because it comes up so often in the political realm. And that's one of the reasons that elected people are afraid to speak out because they, you know, they get branded as being anti-Semitic or they're told you're not being balanced as though that is somehow, um, you know, some upholding principle about this debate. It isn't, it's a political framing. Thank you. So I'm gonna move on to the next um, questions. We have very little time left. Um, we're gonna end at, uh, at 8.30 um, ET. I just have a few technical questions that I'm gonna to group together, which are about the convention. Um, so if uh, folks could answer as, as briefly as possible. Um, the questions are, I'm a member of the NDP. I'm not a delegate. How can I participate in the convention? Um, <clears throat> what number are the resolutions on the convention website? How can, and then another question is, my concern is how can we ensure that these resolutions are ranked uh, in the top five in the policy section? There's no way I'm aware of to be able to check the ranking order nor any process. So any suggestions? So a bit of confusion about how to engage with this. So any, any uh, sort yeah. of clear I, answers I, that folks have? Yeah, I can jump in and try and answer that. Um, um, I would encourage people to go to the NDP website because there are um, a number of responses to some of these questions. Um, first of all, um, if you're not a delegate, you can 
registered to be an observer, but I hasten to add it's incredibly expensive. Um, to be an unwaged delegate is $99 or $150. And if I remember correctly, to be an observer is $250. So that's pretty high, you know, it's, that would be steep for a lot of people. I don't know how else you can observe what's going on. Um, so maybe someone has information on that. In terms of the prioritization process, as I mentioned earlier, on Wednesday, every registered delegate will get the opportunity to do their own ranking um, of up to 10 resolutions within each section. The resolutions that we've spoken about today, the no IRHA resolution is resolution 041120 in section four, um, Canada in the world. The, um, the resolution on um, trade and settlements, um, a very good resolution is 041020. So you have, if you're a delegate, you have the opportunity to rank those resolutions within your 10, and we certainly encourage you to list them as high as possible. Once all of that ranking is done by every delegate, um, there'll be a mathematical calculation and the NDP will produce a list that will go to each delegate. And I believe it will also be on the website the following day they have said, so on uh, Thursday, and we will see what the ranking is. Now, what, what does this mean? Well, because each of these sections for resolutions has a certain time allotment for debate. How far you get down the list and debating each resolution becomes pretty critical because the time factor becomes a limit of how much you get through. So if your resolution is one or two or three, maybe even up to four or five, you will probably get debated in your section. We don't know how, how far that will go. It depends how long debate takes place on each resolution as they're ranked. <coughs> So there's still unknown factors, but the thing we do have some influence over is how we can prioritize the resolutions ourselves as individual delegates. And if we all do that, we have a very good opportunity to make sure that these two get debated. And, and just to add um, a couple of quick questions to add to uh, Libby's really good comprehensive uh, overview uh, in terms of a response. Um, there will, I believe, be an opportunity for people to, to view the convention, all of the plenary sessions uh, on CPAC, because CPAC actually does cover political party conventions, and there's no charge, of course. So I would encourage people who, who want to observe the convention but aren't able to, to be there as delegates or, or, as Libby says, to pay that huge amount of money as observers, um, you can actually watch the convention on CPAC. And I think that's something that people should be aware of. And also just to share that um, on the weekend, there was uh, what was called a socialist round table. Uh, it, it was a Zoom meeting uh, hosted by Jessica McLean actually, and sponsored by Courage uh, and a group called NDP Chat. And um, it was a great opportunity for delegates to, to sort of talk about prioritization of uh, resolutions in, in, in a number of the key panels. In fact, all the key panels and they're gonna be publishing the results of that. I believe today, maybe it's already been published during our, our meeting, but um, what was really exciting is that uh, those delegates uh, prioritized in the foreign policy section, number one, the IHRA resolution, number two, the Palestine resolution on settlements and military bans. So there's a strong signal there from the progressive left-wing delegates who participated in that, but we want to see these issues debated and voted on. We want to see the NDP taking a stand. Wonderful. And I think that that is a very practical and concrete note on which to end our discussion for this evening. Thank you so much. Such an honor for me to be here with this powerhouse group of people. It's been lively, clear, critical, and bold. Thank you, Libby. Thank you, Sven. Thank you, Zahia. Thank you, Hamam and David. It's been totally extraordinary for me to be here with you um, and just very, very informative and timely as well. So I know that I learned a lot. I'm sure others did. Please take the information um, that you've gathered here today and take action. That's, that's always the most important thing, take action. Um, there's just a few, a few short announcements before, uh, before we close out. If you like events like these, like I said earlier, please do consider making a donation to the CFPI. We're totally reliant on our community to help us keep going, help us keep the lights on. Uh, and continue to help us build this critical hub of uh, foreign policy action and analysis. Let's do it together. 
So go to foreignpolicy.ca slash donate. We have a bunch of upcoming events that I want to draw your attention to. Tomorrow, we're uh, co-sponsoring a webinar featuring UN Special Rapporteur on the Negative Impact of Unilateral Coercive Measures, Alina Duan, and MP Don Davies. And this is titled The Human Cost of Sanctions on Venezuela and Canada's Role. On Wednesday, Courage, uh, one of our co-sponsors this evening are hosting an event called Convention 101. Um, David Heat from the CFPI is posted in the chat the link um, if you want to get active and organized with them, uh, find out more there. On Thursday, our CFPI fellow, Professor David Webster, is launching his new book, Challenge the Strong Wind, Canada and East Timor, 75 to 99. He'll be joined by the founder of the East Timor Alert Network, Elaine Briere, who many of you know uh, from our screening of Haiti Betrayed. And the no, a no Fighter Jets Coalition is also launching a fast to stop the jets on April 10th and 11th to honor those killed by Canadian warplanes and to reject the planned purchases of 88 new fighter jets. So you can sign up and find out more about that. The link is also in the chat. Um, there's a lot going on. It's been a great event. Thank you so much to Jace Tanner, who's been in the background and CFPI's David Heap, who've been helping behind the scenes. Thank, to our media, thank you to our media sponsor, Rabble.ca. We love you, Rabble, to our co-sponsoring organizations, IJV, CJPME, Palestine House, Just Peace Advocates, and Courage. Good, e good evening to all of you. Thanks again to our incredible panelists. It's been a terrific night, you, and that's uh, it for our program you. today. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.